Hello everyone. Today's lecture is Properties of Matter. The image on the title slide shows the Eagle Nebula. This was an image taken by the Hubble Telescope. The Eagle Nebula is located approximately 7,000 light years from Earth and in the image we, show, uh, we see uh, gas and dust which are in the process of forming new stars. This image is commonly called the Pillars of Creation. Matter is defined as anything which has mass and takes up space. In chemistry, we place matter into one of two categories, pure substances or mixtures. For pure substances, we have elements, for example, gold or carbon. These are things which cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means. We also have compounds. These are pure substances when we have different elements joined together. For example, water is H2O, glucose is C6H12O6. For mixtures, we classify those as either being homogeneous or heterogeneous. This is discussing the uniform make, uh, makeup throughout the sample when we have a homogeneous sample, for example, salt water. A heterogeneous mixture is one in which there are separate distinct regions that can exist. Uh, a chocolate chip cookie would be an example of this. A representative particle is the smallest particle of a pure substance. For elements, this is going to be an atom. For ionic compounds, which exist as crystals, we would refer to the representative particle as being a formula unit. For example, in salt, NaCl, which is table salt, we have repeats of sodium ions and chloride ions in a one-to-one -one ratio. We see that in this image with the smaller sodium ions and the larger chloride ions being found in a one-to-one -one ratio. Ionic compounds will always contain a metallic and a non-metallic element. Molecular compounds, now the representative particle is a molecule. An example of this would be glucose, C6H12O6. We can see a representation of the glucose molecule here with gray spheres representing carbon atoms, red spheres representing oxygen atoms, and white spheres representing hydrogen atoms. Please note that it is scientifically inaccurate to refer to salt as existing in a molecule state. Uh, we would never talk about salt molecules. We would want to refer to the smallest particle of salt as being a formula unit. A chemical formula can be used to determine the number and type of atoms which are found in a compound. For example, in a water molecule, H2O is the formula for water, we know that there are two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom present. In a formula unit of salt, sodium chloride, we know that for every one sodium ion, there is one chloride ion. In a molecule of glucose, we would find six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. Now, some things to look out for. Here's another example of a chemical formula, C OH2. This would be called calcium hydroxide. When we have part of the formula in parentheses, any subscript will multiply both elements present inside of the parentheses. Calcium hydroxide contains one calcium, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. Uh, another note here, the final line, CO versus CO. This is carbon and oxygen. We would call this carbon monoxide. This is a, a a C and an O, but note that the O is lowercase, so this means cobalt. Physical blend versus chemical bonding. Please note, in a physical blend, we have individual components of the blend that are going to maintain their chemical identities. For example, if we have salt, NaCl, dissolved in water, salt is still present and water is still present. Neither substance has had its identity change. Whereas if we have chemical bonding taking place, the components of a mixture will actually undergo chemical change and will not be found in their initial form. If you take pure sodium and place it into a container of water, a chemical reaction is going to occur. And after the reaction is complete, what we would have instead now would be a combination of sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and hydrogen gas, H2. The next segment of this lecture will work on identifying, classifying, and looking at the changes of matter. In this slide, we note that water, which is normally present in the liquid state, has been changed and altered to exist in the solid state. In this slide, we see a comparison of the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. A solid is something which will hold its shape and does have a fixed or an unchanging volume. 
A liquid is a state of matter which will take on the shape of the container that we place it into. It does have a free surface and the volume is fixed. Please note it is possible for solids and liquids to have their volumes change to a small degree as we heat or cool them, but the amount of change is relatively small, especially when we compare it to what is possible for gases. The third state of matter, gas, will take on the shape of a container that it is located inside of and it will also take on the volume of the container. Let's now take a look at the kinetic theory Java applet to give us a better understanding of how particles behave in the three states of matter. This slide shows a heating curve which relates the physical state to the temperature of a sample. For this graph we are looking at a heating curve of water and we want to find some key points along the way here. So we see melting temperature and boiling temperature. This would be zero Celsius. This would be 100 Celsius. Imagine that we have a sample of water that was in the freezer and we've cooled it below zero degrees Celsius, perhaps to minus 20. So we'd be starting out here. As we start to add heat to that ice sample, originally the heat would go to just warm up the ice. Eventually the ice would reach a temperature of zero degrees Celsius which would allow it to start melting. Here we're going from almost all ice to finally converting here where it would be all converted to liquid. Now that liquid could start to be heated above that temperature of zero Celsius so we would heat the liquid from 10 to 20 all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius. Now once it reaches that temperature of 100 degrees Celsius the water will start to boil where it's turning from liquid into gas. So we see again uh, the conversion from all liquid to all gas. Once all the water has been converted to vapor or the gas form of water, then the temperature could be raised above that point of 100 degrees Celsius. In this slide, we compare physical and chemical properties and also physical and chemical changes. Physical properties would be include examples of things such as color, odor, density, hardness, solubility, melting point, and boiling point. Chemical properties would include things such as flammability, corrosiveness, and reactivity. Uh, now, when we have physical changes, we're looking at things like a change of state. For example, when something melts, it converts from being a solid into a liquid. Uh, or if we were to take an aluminum can and crush it, that would be a physical change because it's still an aluminum can after being crushed. Chemical changes involve actually forming new chemical substances. An example of this would be when iron rusts. You're going from having pure iron to now having a compound of iron oxide. We will take a closer look at physical and chemical changes when you complete experiment three. Let's compare inorganic versus organic compounds. Organic compounds are going to contain carbon. They will typically contain other elements as well, the top ones including hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Please note that a compound does not have to have all of these elements to be considered organic. It does have to have carbon. Inorganic substances, of course, are going to be compounds which do not have any carbon. Uh, some exceptions to this are actually some things which do contain carbon, which are considered to be inorganic for historical reasons. Elemental carbon, a diamond, for example, is considered to be inorganic. Carbon oxides, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide are considered to be inorganic as well. As a general rule, inorganic compounds tend to have very high melting points because of the bonding in, present in these types of compounds. They also have crystalline structures. Organic compounds, as a general rule, tend to have lower melting points and exist as molecules. Uh, the melting point comparison, of course, there can always be some exceptions to this. These are general guidelines based on the two categories of substances. A final learning goal in this unit is to understand the law of conservation of matter and the law of conservation of energy. We need to first consider in chemical reactions that there is a relationship between products and reactants. Reactants are those items which we have present before a chemical change takes place. In our example, hydrogen and oxygen listed here to the left of the arrow are the chemical reactants. The product of this particular chemical change is water, H2O. In the image we see a different way of representing this where we see two molecules of hydrogen reacting with one molecule of oxygen to produce two molecules of water. Again, the reactants are found to the left of the arrow, the products are found to the right of the arrow. 
It's understood that mass will remain constant in both chemical and physical changes. This is because matter cannot be created nor can it be destroyed during chemical reaction processes. So this gives us a slightly different look at that equation. We would now be referring to this as a balanced equation and we can see that we actually need a ratio of two hydrogens reacting with one molecule of oxygen to produce two molecules of water. The coefficients written in front of H2 indicate that there's not one, but there are two H2 molecules. The O2 is not preceded by a coefficient. It's not needed. It's implied that there's just one. The two written in front of H2O indicates that there are two molecules of water. Please note that the amounts of hydrogen and oxygen atoms are now the same before and after the chemical reaction took place. Before the reaction, there are one, two, three, four hydrogens, and after there are one, two, three, four hydrogens. Before the chemical change, there were one, two oxygens present, and now after the chemical change, there are one, two oxygen presents. So the number of atoms is not changing. The identity of the atoms is not changing. What's changing is the way in which those atoms are arranged. Let's take a closer look at that glucose molecule we considered earlier. Again, we see black spheres represent carbon atoms, red represent oxygen atoms, and white represent hydrogen atoms. So we can see here the three-dimensional structure of glucose. Here's another example of a form of inorganic carbon. The image that's supposed to be displaying here is not coming up right now. We'll try this again. This is a buckyball. This is an inorganic form of carbon that contains 60 carbon atoms bonded together in a soccer ball-like structure. Again, this is an inorganic form of carbon. It's elemental carbon. Here we see an animation of sodium chloride. We can see the one-to-one -one ratio of sodium ions the smaller pink color with the chloride ions, which are the larger green. Again, found in a one-to-one -one ratio in a cubic. To determine what type of bonding is present in a compound, I need to know what types of elements are present. If I do have metallic elements present in a compound, the type of bonding will be ionic. So as I'm looking at the periodic table, I want to find this portion of the periodic table. I sometimes we'll call this the stair-step divider in class. If we find an element to the left of the stair steps, it is a metallic element and it will be present in ionic compounds. The elements to the right of the stair steps are non-metallic elements and they're typically found in covalently bonded compounds. There is one exception to the stair-step rule. It is the element hydrogen. Hydrogen can be present in both ionic and covalent compounds. So it's a case-by-case -case situation with hydrogen.